there's a technology now uh, that allows us to preserve uh, fertility despite issues with age that has to do with cryopreservation and what's called egg freezing. And the issue really of egg freezing is based upon the fact that uh, it's based upon the fact that normal fertility declines significantly as we age. And if you look at reproductive function, and this isn't an opinion, this is a fact, it's, it's a population demographic, and it has to do with the number of live births per cycle based upon maternal age. So this is not technology, this is just natural population statistics. And you can see that it declines almost logarithmically uh, from the mid-30s on. And, and that's also related to the fact that there is an increasing risk of what's called aneuploidy. Aneuploidy means abnormal chromosomes. And this is essentially the reason why our fertility declines, is that the chromosomal content of the egg, and therefore the embryo that the egg produces, and therefore the pregnancy, uh, becomes more and more abnormal as we age. And for the most part, abnormal embryos will not implant. They just won't cause a pregnancy. But the ones that aren't so abnormal will cause miscarriages. And a few that are minimally abnormal, uh, that are called upper level trisomies, things like Down syndrome, uh, can actually cause uh, births. But all of these, as you can see, increase significantly with advanced age. The other issue has to do with the actual volume of ovarian tissue. And if you look at the human ovary, it changes significantly because the amount of eggs that we actually produce are there when we're born, and they gradually decline as we age. So we've got two issues to deal with. One is the volume of the ovary and the number of eggs, and the other is how those eggs behave. That's called aneuploid, or abnormal chromosome. So what about this issue of egg freezing? Well, you know, socially, it's something that uh, we can use now to uh, essentially delay having families. This, this wasn't an issue a couple hundred years ago when women were having babies at 18, 19, 20. Now, <clears throat> we have different priorities in our lives. You know, women want to have professions. They, they don't want to have babies uh, when they're young, when they don't have issues. Uh, there are medical reasons, uh, different types of uh, cancers. Uh, there are social reasons from the perspective of simply not having a partner, perhaps. Uh, and the primary risks uh, of waiting is basically what we just spoke about, which is related to advanced maternal age. And uh, if you look at it, again, statistically, after age 45, most of the eggs that a woman produces are not okay. So, you know, and, and again, this is, this is a fact. It's, it's evidenced by uh, population demographics, and the rate of miscarriage, as we spoke about, is related to aneuploidy, also significantly increases uh, as we age as human beings. So if we look at this now in a controlled environment, uh, and we produce a controlled environment technically by something called in vitro fertilization, and that's where uh, you can take stimulates to make more eggs because if you realize that a significant percentage of the eggs that uh, are made may not be normal, then the idea is, well, more is better because then you can maybe find some that are. And that's basically true. Uh, and then when you do in vitro fertilization, the issues of does the egg fertilize are all sort of controlled because that's done in a laboratory that you can actually genetically test the embryo in the laboratory to make sure it's okay. And so when you do that sort of thing, you change the, the equation. You change the pregnancy rates by actually increasing them. 
above and beyond what normal physiology is. But nonetheless, the issue of age is still a fix in vitro fertilization. This is fertility sort of in the best of circumstances, and this is per cycle. And if you look at the numbers, they go down again significantly as age increases. The last column says ovum donation. And if you'll notice that ovum donation is the same, if not better, than the younger group of patients that are listed as below 35. And the reason for this is that ovum donors are young women in their 20s usually who donate eggs to women who are older, who are having issues with their fertility and cannot conceive for different reasons. Or maybe they've had their ovaries removed for different reasons. But the technology is such that uh, if you use an ovum donor, you get the same chances of a pregnancy as you had when you were the age of the donor. So, for example, if the donor is 25 and you're 45, you can get the same statistics as you had when you were 25 by using the donor's eggs. And, and that's a very remarkable um, statistic that basically confirms the fact that the decrease in fertility really is not related to the uterine environment, not related to the physiology of the human being, but rather to the genetic content of the egg that's made. So ovum donation pregnancy rates stay the same, regardless of the age of the patient. And it can go, uh, continue the same well into the 50s. Uh, but using uh, one's own genetic eggs, uh, it decreases significantly so that by the time a woman reaches 50, it's about zero. Yes. Let's talk about what we do. We optimize five aspects of fertility. Number one, ovarian function, right? And that involves ovulation. So, of course, if you're not ovulating, that's a problem because that means you're not making any eggs. All right, and follicle count. How many are you making? How many follicles are basically eggs, right? And when, once the egg gets uh, fertilized, it's called embryos, right? And, and does it mature properly and so forth? All those are little details that are pretty important, right? And it only takes one, unless you want to have twins, but, uh, but it really only takes one good egg and uh, one good sperm. They come together, unite, and they fertilize, and you've got an embryo, and then you've got to implant it. So that is the function of the uterus. If your lining is insufficient, how many people garden here? So you do gardening, everybody? Okay, gardening, right? For those of you who don't garden, let me explain to you. You have to have good soil. You have to have good topsoil. That's where all the nutrients are. And if you have a field of good topsoil, you drop a seed in it, you water it, it grows. It just grows. But if you have an arid desert where there's no topsoil, you drop a seed in it, you water it, because what happens? Nothing. Okay? That's what it takes. So that's the function of the uterine lining. The uterine lining is full of blood, full of nutrients, and what does it do? It feeds the embryo. I mean, gosh, you got to get blood supply, nutritional supply, right? Third, the terrain. If your terrain, meaning your uterine environment is full of rocks and debris and valleys and, and mountains and so forth, you know, that's complicated. You're making it hard for those little sperm to swim around. I mean, it's a long ways to get there, right? And then so anything that's blocking the way, anything that prevents you from having really good, you know, lining and easy for implantation for the embryo to implant, you're interfering with it. So that means endometriosis, fibroids, cysts, anything that gets in the way, we got to make sure that it's taken care of. And then we look at endocrine, meaning hormonal system, right? You've got the follicular and spinning hormone, FSH. That's the number most of you are going to be very focused on because if your FSH level is above uh, 12, you start to kind of get nervous. And if it goes over 15, you start to panic. And we've seen patients over 20. And at that point, they go, oh my God, you know, what are my chances of ever getting pregnant? Because when that number goes up, it means that the signal from the pituitary to your ovary is on overdrive. In other words, the pituitary is the master gland, is the commander going, hello ovary, let's produce something. No, no answer. Let's send another messenger down there. 
And pretty soon, right, that number goes up, up, up. It means that the pituitary has been knocking on the door of the ovary and it's not responding. So that's why high FSH number is alarming for most people, right? Understandable. Estrogen level, if your estrogen is low, well, that is responsible for your lining. So your low, you know, low estrogen, small, thin lining, insufficient. Progesterone is responsible for keeping your baby. Once you get pregnant, you know, if you have low progesterone, you're going to miscarry. Thyroid, thyroid is a huge. Yeah, this is a this thyroid disorders more often than not interferes with pregnancy, big time, because it affects ovarian function, affects insulin. They talk about pancreas. If you have insulin resistance, you have PCOS, most likely polycystic ovarian syndrome. Right? How many people have heard of that? Right. So, right. So, PCOS is where you have you have a problem with uh, uh, your androgen. Okay. So you're not ovulating properly. You are resistant to insulin. So here's what happens. If you have insulin resistance, this is a kind of a pre-diabetic problem, or di you know type two diabetes is insulin resistance. You eat, the body produces insulin. Insulin is supposed to open your cells for energy because glucose is supposed to go into cells. But your cells don't open their doors. So the level of the sugar starts to accumulate and elevate in your bloodstream. Then the body goes, whoa, it's too high. We gotta convert that. So we take the blood sugar and then parts of this fat. So it converts fat. Meanwhile, your cells are basically saying, I'm hungry. So it sends a signal to the brain and says, send me food. The brain says, well, I just sent you something an hour ago. Well, I didn't get it, so send some more. So that's why you're hungry all the time. Even though you eat, 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 you're not satiated because you're, you, your cells are hungry, crying, and hey, send me some more food. The brain doesn't know why you're not getting food, so it keeps getting, okay, hungry, eat some more. And you eat, and it just keep converting to fat. So that's a problem. Okay, because then it affects your whole hormonal system, and now you've got too much testosterone. You got, you know, um, uh, so so your your whole body goes into an imbalance, and you can't get pregnant that way. And in, in, in other cases, the pituitary is the problem. The master gland, the commander, is not working properly. Maybe there's a tumor. Maybe there's an insufficiency or hyperactivity, and it causes hormonal balance. So we got to make sure that is balanced too, right? And finally stress and immunity. A lot of people don't pay attention to this, but I say this is probably your number two reason why most people don't get pregnant. Because you don't have time. Yeah, that's the reality, okay? So here's what happens. Remember I said biologists say you are primed to be pregnant and pass on your genes? All right, absolutely. That is your genetic destiny. However, there is one thing and only one thing that is going to prevent you from doing that, which is survival. You see, when you've got a saber tooth tiger on your tail, the last thing your body wants to do is pregnant. You know why? Because if you're pregnant, you can't run that fast and you'll be lunch me. Okay? And so nature has devised this program. It's very simple, right? You're stressed, your body's going to release adrenaline or cortisol, and that goes up. Now you're ready to fight or run like heck. And then what, uh, what happens? Your body completely shuts down your reproductive system, diverts all the nutrients to where it needs to go, the heart, the muscle, and the brain. And so you don't have much resources in your ovaries, you're not gonna get pregnant. Not lack of resources in the ovary, uh, the, your, your uterus, you're not gonna get pregnant. So that is what happens. Or what happens is your stress is so high, it kicks off what we call autoimmunity. Your immune system now is on a crawl. And as soon as it figures out there's something foreign in your uterus, what does it do? It attacks it and gets rid of it. That's called miscarriage, right? And that's what happens. So autoimmunity can play a role in this as well. It doesn't have to be all the miscarriage. There are many reasons why people miscarry, but that is one of the reasons. Okay. All right.